Welcome to Scope's Portfolio Manager Conference session. My name is Man Qing Sun, Mutual Fund Analyst from Scope Analysis. For today's session, I'm very pleased to be joined by our guest speaker, Alan Seo, Strategy Leader, Asia Credit, and Co portfolio manager of the Asia Dynamic Bond Fund at 91. He's joining us on the line this afternoon from Hong Kong. Good afternoon, Alan. Hi there, everyone. Good afternoon. Hi there, everyone. Good afternoon. So our discussion today is a featured segment of Scope's Asia Investment Special Series 2021, which was kicked off with a very insightful panel discussion in April, where Alan was also on the panel seat. Today, we will zoom into the fast-growing Asia fixed income market. This time, with Alan's expertise in Asia markets, we will not only talk about China, but also other markets such as India, South Korea, that is less familiar to European investors, but could be of interest to you. Here is how the hour is going to work. We will break it into two sections where Alan will first work us through the landscape overview of Asia fixed income market and a snapshot of 91's relevant Asia bond strategies. Following that, we will have prepared some um, questions that investors are most in interested in. For example, the US Treasury yield, interest rate, inflation, several high profile defaults recently, uh, the recent downgrade of some Chinese uh, corporate bond, etc. This, this discussion will last about 45 minutes, and I would encourage all of you to type in your questions to start an active dialogue with Alan. So you could also view the full clip of replay on our platform, Scope Explorer. So Alan, as I mentioned, you were on the panel round table where we kicked off our Asia Investment Special Series back in April. It was really an inspiring discussion, many exciting and well-rounded topics about Asia capital markets between the three brilliant uh, guest speakers, including you, yourself, active exchange of ideas. And for our investors who did not yet have time to, to tune in on the round table, would you introduce yourself? Tell us about yourself again. What, what is the role in the team and your background relevant to the region and asset class? Right. Okay. Thank you very much, okay. uh, Manting, and uh, good morning again, everyone uh, over there. Thank you for your time and for your interest today. Uh, so my name is Alan Xiao. I'm part of the 91 Emerging Market Corporate Debt Franchise. Uh, so that's the part of 91 that looks at investing in the corporate bonds uh, space, uh, both in, in hard currency primarily, but also uh, in local currency. Uh, so we are uh, a fundamental uh, sort of credit selection uh, house. What we try to do is pick the securities of good companies uh, with the intention that we, we aim to make money for our investors over the, the medium to long term from a combination of the, uh, the, the coupon that we receive uh, from these investments, but also the capital gain from selecting better companies. And that gain is achieved because if you choose a company well, then between the time you start investing in the company and, and the time that your investment period is ends, maybe because the bond is repaid or refinanced, um, you hope that the improvement in the quality of the company results in a reduction in the yield or the spread uh, that investors require for that risk. And as a result, the, the bond will trade at a higher price. Uh, so in that regard, we are no different to many uh, long only um, sort of equity specialists. So uh, like them, we also try to find the best companies. Uh, it's just that, you know, when we do our work, um, we're much more focused on, on the debt side of, of, the, of the equation, uh, but the, the, the work is exactly the same. Um, uh, I guess, you know, we, we think of ourselves as, you know, adding value from, uh, you know, beyond the, the selection, but in terms of the security side, thinking about, um, you know, which particular bond to buy. Uh, because companies often have one type of share or at most two or three, but they could have 10 or 20 bonds. Um, and it takes some skill to be able to pick out, once you've even selected the companies, how best to invest. Uh, so myself, uh, briefly, um, I was born in Malaysia. Uh, I have Chinese heritage. Uh, so my, my grandparents uh, were originally from that region. Uh, I grew up all over Southeast Asia and uh, moved with my family to Australia uh, as a young man. I completed university there before um, going for uh, my my first job was uh, qualifying as, as an accountant with Deloitte uh, in Western Australia. Uh, and then I completed my MBA in, in France. Uh, and it was at the conclusion of that that I started my career in London, uh, first in investment banking with uh, Solomon Smith Barney, uh, and then moving on to the investing side. Uh, my first investing job was actually uh, with a small firm called Alchemy Special uh, Situations. And we spent uh, most of 2008, 2009, which is the Lehman crisis, uh, unpicking uh, value opportunities in European credit. 
Um, and so, uh, you know, that was my, my introduction to investing was sort of buying debt uh, in the worst possible uh, down cycle in financial markets, taught me many lessons. Uh, and so when I finally uh, sort of moved into emerging markets uh, with Blue Bay, uh, which was the, the place I was just prior to 91, um, the intention was to bring developed market uh, methodology, developed market sensibility and, and values in terms of how we look at investments to the emerging market. So at that point, the, the, the emerging markets were the most um, uh, interesting markets available to me in fixed income. Uh, here was, uh, you know, very large, very diverse, fast growing. Um, and yet uh, still relatively unknown and relatively uninvested by the wider community. Uh, more than 11 years later, I mean, I think it's it's still very much the case. A lot more investors are now looking at the space, but we feel you know it's very attractive and very durable. Um, and the most exciting uh, geography within uh, emerging markets is Asia, um, and particularly for, for European and uh, let's say developed market credit investors, and the reason for that is Asia is the only region within uh, the emerging market that has the complete selection in terms of it offers you uh, investment grade, high yield, um, uh, the whole spectrum of available credit. So it is a destination that can satisfy uh, an allocation uh, over the medium to long term. It's not something that you have to time this week and get out next week or get out next month. It's not a, a thematic thing. It's, it's, it's a market worthy of, of longer term attention. So that's just a, a quick introduction uh, of me and uh, the team that I'm part of. Thank you, Alan. I think it's a very well-rounded profile of you. Without further ado, I should now give you the floor. Would you give us a snapshot of the landscape? For example, uh, we are interested in the size and composition of, of Asia bond market. What is the current macro sentiment? Are Asia bonds riskier than its peers? Why do they deserve a dedicated allocation? Maybe a brief introduction of the strategy that you are co-managing. Yeah, sure. So um, on this first page, uh, can everyone see the slides? Just checking. Um, uh, hopefully, no, no, no problems there. Uh, okay. Showing any objection? Okay. So uh, this first slide is just a, a brief description of the team. I think that the main thing I wanted to point out here, other than having briefly introduced myself, is that you know I don't do this alone. I'm part of a a much bigger family uh, of, of investors. So uh, the, the group of people on the left-hand side of this page, myself and Victoria Hiling are the, the co-portfolio managers of this strategy. Uh, Victoria and myself are also the co-portfolio managers of the broader emerging market corporate uh, debt uh, franchise. So the investing that we do in Asia uh, basically has a home uh, within our emerging market investment practice. And why is that important? That means that when we are looking for the best companies in Asia, we are not just comparing them to only other Asian companies. We're comparing them to the entire universe uh, of available corporates within the emerging markets and beyond. And that means our ruler is slightly different to someone who would sit in Asia and only look at Asia uh, because it's not good enough for us that the company is, is good for its uh, neighborhood. We, we want it to be truly world class from an uh, investing point of view. Uh, in order to do that, we need a specialist team of, of analysts, um, and, and th that's the team you see in terms of the names just below me. Um, and we have a dedicated team. We're aligned by sector, which means that all of our analysts um, analyze that sector globally, worldwide. We feel that this offers a much better economy of scale and scope in terms of the analysis that's being done. Um, it's much easier to be an expert within an industry vertical than to be someone, for example, who is an expert on Brazil, but you know, how are you going to compare a Brazilian oil and gas company to a Brazilian um, protein uh, industry or you know, a sort of beef or agricultural business? So the skills are slightly different and the, the way you analyze these things are very different. So we think a, a sector focus makes a lot more uh, sense than a regional focus. Um, currently, most of the team sits in, in London and that's just because uh, of, of history. So, and because that London is a very convenient time zone to look across the emerging markets. I've recently relocated to Hong Kong and we will be putting down resources here uh, to enable us to tackle uh, the investments in Asia much more in real time. Uh, but we've been looking at all markets, uh, Latin America, Samia, and Asia uh, for uh, many, many years now. Um, and you know, have been uh, a key feature of this work is, is visiting frequently and meeting with management teams and the businesses on the ground. Uh, you know, seems a, a very odd thing to say now after two years of, of COVID uh, restrictions. Uh, but you know, in the good old days, we used to travel quite a bit. 
Um, on the right hand side, briefly on this page, you know, we in the corporate side are part of a much bigger emerging market debt franchise. So we have experts who are whose only job it is to have uh, you know deep thoughts about um, currencies and uh, sovereign risk profiles uh, and and interest rates. So we draw very richly from their experience, and that helps us make better decisions on the corporate side. So that's a quick overview. Um, so. What we're here to talk about today is Asia, and broadly speaking, there are there are two uh, main uh, ways to sort of get involved uh, in the Asia credit market. So there are the onshore markets, uh, and these are the the credit markets of each country in Asia. But these are typically in in local currency, um, and so the the biggest one and the most interesting one is is China because the the, the local market, um, the local debt market in China is very large, second largest in the world, um, and it's also very liquid. Uh, but the other markets are at various stages of development. So it, it is very much possible to, to look at corporate investments in this space. And we are very excited about the future of this uh, uh, asset class. But for now, the, the, the most immediate uh, opportunity is, is onshore in China. So that's one element. The other element is the bonds issued by corporates in, in, uh, in Asia in dollars. Um, and you know, just because it's in dollars, uh, uh, you, know, you, may, you may think, OK, well, why is that uh, the case? Um, so, like the other uh, parts of the emerging market corporate universe, the dollar has been become the universal funding currency, um, and so a lot of the top tier corporates, the very best companies, are able to issue uh, bonds in this currency to be able to take advantage of the broadest investment markets. So, um, when we invest in this asset class, we're not taking local currency risk because uh, the bonds are issued in, in hard currency. Um, but what we do have to take account of is to make sure that the companies that that we lend to, the companies that issue these bonds, have the type of uh, profile that enables them to meet uh, their obligations in dollars without a problem. So uh, going through on this slide, I'll show you uh, an example of why uh, we think Asia uh, is such an important uh, uh, region within the EM. So the first point is the growth profile. Um, so I think it comes as no surprise that um, over the last 10 or 20 years, uh, you know, there's been a, a gradual shift um, Asia, from a very low base, um, has uh, been emerging, if you like, driven mainly by the entry of China into the WTO, um, but also from the inter-Asian trade that that has engendered. So this is a story of a, a grassroots growth uh, that is very much anchored in the lower and, and middle classes and, uh, and the eradication of poverty. So, uh, and because of that, the quality of this growth is also quite robust. Um, unlike some of the growth we see elsewhere in the developed markets, for example, which has led to um, or at, at current levels of, of, of developments, just to, uh, in terms of where we are in, in the cycle, uh, in the West, you know, a lot of growth, you know, still comes at the expense of, let's say, social economic equality. It comes at, at the expense of, let's say, uh, you know, environmental issues, for example. Whereas um, it's still in Asia, a lot of this growth is, is um, let's say, uh, closer to um, uh, very basic. It's it's uh, it's prevalent. It is it is broad based, um, and because it is happening from a very low GDP per capita basis, uh, it also means that the quality of this growth is a lot more resilient and robust, um, and it is very well distributed. So um, the key point I wanted to take away from this slide is is obviously uh, you know the the divergence of those two lines, the fact that Asia Pacific compared to Europe, North America, um, and Japan were um, on a convergence trajectory, and now Asia is, is overtaking. Um, and the role of the region as a contributor of growth and savings for the world is only going to increase over time. It's not going to increase infinitely, uh, but between now and the next 10, 20 years, um, we think this is a durable theme. Um, and at the heart of this is China, because that's been the largest and, and most important engine of that growth. Uh, but it's not just China. This is also the story of India. It's also the story of Indonesia. It's also the story of the Philippines. Um, and in the next five to ten years, it will become the story of uh, new countries, countries that you know we may have visited on holiday, but have not really yet become uh, you know household names as investment destinations. Places like Thailand, Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, Laos. These are all countries that are again you know the same position that China was in 20 years ago, emerging from a from a very uh, low base, but with a lot of upside to come, and a lot of those gains uh, being quite easy to achieve because it's the zero to 1,000 step, not the 2,000 to 5,000 step, if you like to see it that way. 
On the next slide then, um, what do you get when you look at Asian corporates as, as a universe? Um, you know, one could be mistaken for thinking that this is quite a narrow investment base, uh, but I think it's important to realize that it's a very diversified, granular universe. Um, and I think, uh, you know, just quickly highlighting here, so this is a universe of, of, uh, of investments that is, has a credit quality of, of triple B. So it is a triple B uh, uh, plus, in fact, BAA1 triple B plus. It has a, a yield of, you know, 3.35%, very attractive in today's context, very attractive spread, not overly long in duration. Um, and it is very diverse and very granular, uh, nearly 2,000 underlying bonds uh, coming from 640 issuers uh, and more than 17 countries. And on the right-hand side in that uh, pie chart, you can see that this is a very broadly uh, diversified group of sectors as well. Um, and importantly, for a fixed income asset class, you're getting exposure to uh, different types of sectors than you would expect from the equity side. So one thing I would draw to, to your attention is the size of the quasi-sovereign uh, and financial sectors, which are very large, and also the size of the sovereign uh, sector, which is that dark green uh, patch as well. So these are sectors you don't tend to see in equity markets uh, because by definition, governments don't have traded equities, um, but they provide a very strong, stable and resilient base uh, because obviously debt instruments issued by governments, um, uh, provided that these are sound governments, tend to be uh, very uh, suitable as, as, uh, as fixed income investments, uh, even if they might not be as suitable for, for equity. Um, and here I won't dwell too long. Uh, what I wanted to show you on this slide is really just to, to say that, um, you know, one of the biases uh, that we might have when we look at Asia as a new region is, you know, it seems you're awfully far away. I don't know a lot about it. Um, uh, and, and that's one thing that we're, 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 you know, here to hopefully help to, to dispel. The second point is to say that the Asia credit market is quite different to the Asia equity market. Um, the composition is very different. And, and as a result, the texture of that uh, of that um, uh, universe is very different. And here, what I wanted to point out is that if you just look uh, purely at the top 10 issuers on the equity and credit side, you can see uh, that um, the, the top uh, table on, on the uh, right hand, uh, sort of the middle table on the right hand side will show you the, the top 10 largest issuers uh, for the MSCI Asia. So this is the equity index. You'll see names like Alibaba and Tencent who are present also um, in the Asia credit universe, uh, but at much smaller percentages. However, you have names like Taiwan Semiconductor and Samsung, which are not present at all. And likewise, if you look at the table below, you can see that the largest weight within the Asia credit universe is the Indonesian government bond, followed by the Philippine government bond, both of which you, you cannot get um, on the equity side. So uh, not only is it a very interesting region, but Asia credit is, is, a, is a different animal to Asia credit, uh, sorry, Asia equities. Um, and in fact, they're complements because, uh, you know, much as, you know, we've seen across the world where uh, in a developed market universe where the correlation between, uh, let's say, the NASDAQ and the U.S. bond market has completely broken down. So it used to be that you own bonds to hedge your equity exposure so that on days where the equity part of your portfolio was not performing, your bonds would perform. Uh, that correlation is completely broken down in the QE age. It's very much still alive uh, in, in Asia and in EM more broadly because the composition is so different. So you are buying a very defensive, a very different um, asset class when you look at credit. So that's another reason to, to consider it. Now, the main reason why you should invest in anything is, is obviously the potential return. Um, and then very closely followed by that is, is um, how uh, that return is achieved. And what is your experience when you generate that return? So what is your risk? How, how volatile is that asset class? And here, I think Asia Credit really has, uh, you know, something to be proud of because if you look at uh, the panel we've put together here, comparing Asia Credit to all the other major fixed income asset classes that investors can take advantage of, you can see that it really stands head, head and shoulders above. So let's start with yield. At 3.4%, Asia Credit is only less yieldy than EM Credit, which makes sense because EM includes other jurisdictions, some of which are lower rated, and global high yield credit. And that also makes sense because global uh, Asia credit is investment grade uh, on average. So um, it's a very attractive quality yield. Uh, it's not yield that you receive from, from buying uh, junk rated companies. Second, on the duration side, it is among the shortest duration asset classes available. So uh, in a world where we are now very conditioned to be fearful of, of the end of accommodation, the end of, of easy money, um, this is also a fixed income asset class that is 
less exposed to duration and therefore less vulnerable to future rate rises should uh, the, the, the QE era end sooner than we expect. Um, given this, uh, the, you can see that the annual return on a 10-year period within this uh, universe is very attractive at 5.3%. So this is not just the current yield, but also the capital gains over time. Uh, that this, this is because the asset class has been improving in quality since it started, and that makes sense because as the region continues to grow and mature, the companies get stronger and stronger, they get higher and higher rated, and as a result, the yields required by investors uh, are lower and lower. So that's why the, the, the average return has been higher than the current yield, and at 5.3%, it's very attractive and compares very favorably uh, to all the other credit asset classes you can see. Next is vol. Uh, and this is, you know, a blunt tool, you know, it's not the only measure of risk, but here you can see uh, that the vol of the asset class is the lowest among all the other fixed income asset classes you can find, including European credit and including global ag. So here you have an asset class that yields more, is less risky, uh, and the next uh, step is to show you the maximum drawdown in the last 10 years. And here you can see that the max drawdown is no worse than global ag credit. So this is an experience, or this is an asset class, which over the last 10 years has delivered much better returns at lower vols um, and with lower maximum drawdowns, one of the lowest uh, across the asset class, resulting in a sharp ratio of 1.2, which is the highest um, uh, across the space. So that's, I think, in a nutshell, why we think this is interesting, why we think as a region, uh, it deserves a, a standalone uh, consideration. Um, and, uh, and you know, that's why we're, we're very excited to talk to you uh, about it today. Um, now, just before we move on, I just wanted to show you this one chart. Um, I think a picture is often worth a, a thousand words. And here, I think what we wanted to show is this is the most recent crisis um, of, of, of recent memory. So most of us in this room uh, would have been uh, a part of this, uh, this market moment uh, and would have experienced the, the COVID drop that happened in March of last year. And what we wanted to highlight is the resilience of the Asia dollar credit market uh, versus other asset classes and show that in that red line, uh, that is you know, a, a real life example in, in recent times of how the asset class um, outperformed. So it was a much uh, shallower drop followed by a recovery that was almost at the same pace. Um, and only global equities has recovered more uh, in, in that period. And with that mentioning, um, I think, um, you know, we, we have probably uh, covered most of the ground that we need to cover uh, for this session. Uh, uh, yeah, sure. Thank you, Alan, for the presentation. Um, I think exactly you have covered a lot of interesting topics. Now we move on to the second session with some specific questions. Like, um, for example, we start with the question on um, the countries within Asia region. China, India and Indonesia were among the largest recipients of yield seeking foreign investment last year. It might not be the case this year. Uh, given a diver divergence in economic recoveries, a dollar rally, and whether U.S. rates will be kept low. Um, what are the countries within Asia that are still considered more attractive compared to their low for longer U.S. peers? We know China, but are there any other countries? Yeah, no, I think um, the, the answer was right there at the start of your, 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 your section. I think the, the three most uh, interesting countries within Asia are China, uh, India and Indonesia. China and, well, I, I guess demographically the most advantaged country in this region is India. That used to be China, but uh, China has now passed the peak in terms of its age profile. Um, and it's entering a period because of the one child policy where, um, you know, it, it will not enjoy the same demographic dividends it once did. That doesn't mean that, you know, the, the story has uh, has changed. It just means that um, you know, one of the, the the biggest engines, which was the demographic profile, will not burn as brightly. Uh, that's still the case, though, in India and Indonesia. Um, now, on the other hand, these are both countries where the 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 level of of the economies are still a lot lower than they are in China. So um, uh, there is a lot more potential upside. Uh, but given the differences in uh, you know the starting conditions, we we would expect these stories to play out uh, over a much longer time horizon. Um, and within these three countries, you have quite a, a, a reasonable mix, right? Now, the other countries within the region that I think are worth discussing um, are Korea, um, uh, to a, a certain extent, uh, Hong Kong, uh, Macau, 
uh, as well. Uh, these are smaller regions, very tightly related uh, to China, but they are distinct in that the, the shape of their economy is quite different. Um, one of the things that uh, that you know uh, we find very interesting at the moment is uh, within Macau, one of the largest sectors is gaming, um, and gaming is is a, is a sector that has suffered uh, through COVID because social distancing has meant that many of these venues have had to close. Uh, but they're very very popular tourist destinations both within the region and from without, um, and so they are very well poised to enjoy a, a very uh, quick recovery. Uh, when uh, COVID uh, ultimately ends. Um, and there are also businesses where uh, variable costs are quite low. Uh, you know, obviously if, if you, you know, if you have a gaming venue and you cannot open, you can shut it. And, you know, it's not like running a mill or a plant where you have to keep it going even when you're not producing anything. Uh, so these businesses can, uh, can be uh, managed uh, very carefully during uh, downturns and we're quite uh, positive about uh, the outlooks uh, going forward. Uh, so, uh, you know, mentioning these uh, these countries, I, I guess, you know, you have exporters, you have um, countries that are moving up the value chain, um, but also countries that are entering the value chain for the first time. So some of the role that China used to perform as being the lowest cost manufacturer in the world is now being performed by other countries in Asia. So Vietnam, Bangladesh, Cambodia, for example. Uh, meanwhile, China is trying to move up uh, and do uh, higher, uh, more complicated manufacturing. Uh, the same way that Korea has, uh, so you know a very big manufacturer of, of high tech, um, and then you have uh, uh, countries like India and Indonesia, which are more traditional uh, EM countries. So uh, a big reliance on commodities, uh, but you know very much geared to the return of global growth. Uh, so that gives you a nice selection of of, uh, of themes, and for an investor with a, a looking for a balanced portfolio, it's a very nice uh, menu to choose from. Uh -huh. So we know that COVID is, might not no, no longer be the biggest tail risk and, and the pandemic has been replaced by fears of inflation, a bond mark, market uh, uh, taper tantrum. And do you think long term treasury yields will head higher in 2021? And how would this impact Asian bonds? Which which Asian bonds would be the most at risk in Asia as, as U.S. inflation expectations increase? Yeah, this is a great question, especially since we had the Fed overnight. Um, so I think this has been the big question for fixed income investors everywhere, which is the path of, of, of both the Fed as well as the ECB. Um, my crystal ball is, is, as, uh, is working as poorly as everyone else's. So I think it's very difficult for us to forecast what rates will do. I think it's very clear that we are in a moment now where inflationary forces are quite prominent. Um, but remembering how low inflation has been for a very long time, and given the Fed's framework uh, to target average uh, inflation rather than, than current inflation, um, it's important to realize that just from pure mathematics, um, we can experience a longer period of higher inflation before average inflation returns to that target. Um, and meanwhile, we're, we're continuing to see very sluggish recovery in employment. All this, I think, speaks to uh, rates ending the year probably not very different than where they are today, um, but with a lot more volatility. And I think the reason for this, at least the way that we see it, is that it will take time for the data to, to be able to show a clear trend. Uh, and we, we need that time because if we think about comparisons, uh, even now in, in, in June, we're still comparing year over year to a period where COVID was very much um, at, the, at the start or at the you know, very peak of, of the concerns. So all the comparisons we are making, June this year versus June last year, or July this year versus July last year, Will, will, will flatter because last year, you know, the world was in a much weaker position. So we need to sort of emerge from this period and, and start looking into readings from later in the year and potentially next year before we can say that a trend is clearly established. And because of that, um, there's no way for us to make a firm view on, on the path of inflation. And therefore, a lot of the price action that we're seeing in treasuries is, is purely um, you know, I, I hesitate to use the word speculation, but that's what it is. Um, it's investors positioning for a future that they don't really see yet. Um, and so as a result of that, we expect rates to stay uh, uh, pretty much uh, range bound, but with a lot of volatility. Now, Asia Credit, um, because it has experienced uh, some idiosyncratic risks, uh, which we will discuss a bit later on, um, uh, has meant that it is not uh, uh, at present times um, uh, in a place where either the spread or yield is in a very attractive uh, place. So what does that mean? 
Uh, that means that over the last year, um, other asset classes, particularly U.S. investment grade, U.S. high yield, European investment grade, Euro high yield, have enjoyed much better performance and are at valuations that are a lot closer to their all-time uh, highs, right? Um, Asia credit, because it, there's been a couple of events, um, is at a very attractive level. And therefore, if you think about the ability of the asset class to withstand a shock in rates, uh, then the asset class with the shortest duration and the biggest spread buffer is most resilient. And Asia credit, because it didn't start the year uh, expensive and because it's not expensive today, is very well positioned relative to other asset classes and other regions in EM on this basis. Mm -hmm. So let's let's look at the investor's own portfolio structure and sell sites have been recommending dedicated Asian investment for a while now. But why is still the case that it's still largely underrepresented? Um, how are international investors approaching opportunities in Asia bond market? What is the interplay between onshore versus offshore bonds? What, what does the optimal exposure look like, according to your opinion? So uh, we've been having a lot of conversations with investors um, uh, institutionally within Europe, uh, especially in Germany, uh, but also uh, elsewhere, uh, and, and also um, in markets like uh, America, uh, Japan, uh, Canada, and, and also Korea. Um, I think for a lot of developed market institutions uh, within the fixed income portion of their portfolios, the key question that they've been trying to answer is, where can I find quality yield in a world where because of the actions of central banks, there is not a lot of yield to be had. Um, so that's been one area. Then once they've made that decision, um, you know, perhaps they would look at an allocation towards EM. And, and I think the next question they ask is, where should this allocation come from? Now, if it's going to come from within, uh, you know, let's say the high yield portion of their portfolio or the emerging market portion of their portfolio, um, uh, you know, Asia does have a role to play because within that segment, so Asia high yield is attractive. Um, or if they are planning to make an allocation from the investment grade side of their portfolio, uh, Asia again uh, has a role to play there because at the same rating, uh, Asia IG spreads are also very attractive. Um, so this is just a, purely in the dollar space. I think, you know, given the chart I just showed you uh, with the sharp ratios, I think most of us is looking at this, you know, have to acknowledge that on a 10 year average, so this is not one year of, of risk rewards, this is the last 10 years, uh, Asia, you know, is a durable, um, asset class that that deserves a um, a uh, let's say permanent allocation, and I think the way to think about it is sizing that allocation such that it makes sense, as opposed to tactically you know dipping in and out. Now, alongside that, so this is uh, if you like the 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 answer to the question: How do I replace a section of my my bunds, or how do I replace a section of my uh, my Volkswagen or my Nestle bond holdings or, you know, my General Electric bond holdings. So how do I replace hard currency bond holdings from other markets with more yield at the same quality? So that's, uh, and the answer is, is Asia should be considered, right? Um, the second uh, uh, qu uh, question that we've been dealing with is, and this is more dominated by entities like sovereign wealth funds or large pension funds that have an allocation purely for reserves or, or, or cash management. And here I think the Asia onshore credit market is very interesting. So these are Chinese onshore bonds. And why is that? Well, uh, Chinese government bonds are AA rated and offer a 3.1, 3.2% yield at the five-year duration mark or five-year maturity. So this is you know, many, many more times uh, more yield than you can get from a bond or from a US treasury, from a government that you know, we all fully expect to pay all debts as and when they fall due. Uh, in a currency that has enjoyed very strong appreciation trends uh, over the last year. And we expect these trends to be in place for some time for two main reasons. One is China continues to want to internationalize its currency. And for that to happen, that means more foreign investors will be looking at it and it will become a more important part of, of many indices and also many reserve requirements. Uh, second, uh, China is moving from being uh, the lowest cost manufacturer of the world where uh, uh, let's say a very weak currency was, was favorable to being a consumer, a net importer of, of, uh, of stuff, whether it's fashion, luxury, or technology, um, having a stronger currency for China today has a different value to in the past. And therefore, uh, because of this very simple but very powerful intuition, um, we think the path uh, you know, going forward for, for China rates and FX is more constructive than it was before. And as a result, this offers another potential replacement. So this is not to replace a Volkswagen bond or a, 
uh, or a Nestle bond, but this is to replace core holdings of bonds and treasuries themselves. So within that, um, you know, can you allocate some portion uh, to Chinese government bonds at high ratings, at double A ratings, with much better yield and also reducing the duration that you need to take uh, to take advantage of that yield. So these are the two conversations that we're having. Great. So um, let's talk about um, Chinese corporates. We saw several pretty high profile defaults in 2020, including SOE names in China last year. Um, for example, the state backed Huarong. Um, I just saw it, it was among the top uh, 10 issuer. Um, so domestic rating downgrades of corporate bonds have more than tripled this year in China in the wake of a spate of um, defaults. So how are these affecting investor sentiment? Yeah, no doubt. I think this is part of the reason why the uh, Asia credit market is very attractive at the moment. So um, part of what uh, the development of the regional market needs to do is, uh, you know, for a long time, uh, Chinese onshore markets in particular, there have not been enough defaults. And that's uh, because although the market is very large, um, it is relatively immature um, and it has not had the benefit of a lot of foreign investors. And that has meant that um, it's been dominated by, by local investors um, and it's been dominated by a culture that has been uh, that has come out of bank lending. As opposed to the to the values and culture that we have in the West, where capital markets and bank markets are separate. Um, and because of that, there's this unspoken belief, uh, at least in the past, that, you know, all debts, particularly if they are incurred by any company or any corporate that's linked to the government, is implicitly guaranteed. Uh, and this is something the government has been trying to change for some time, uh, at least the last 10 years. Now, this is something that they have to do slowly and carefully, because on the one hand, they know that this is necessary for the healthy development of their market. They, they need to break this connection because of the moral hazard that it presents. And secondly, they can't move too quickly because they, they need to allow time for local participants to learn these lessons and develop the skills, which is to say, develop the ability to, to, to uh, create credit uh, on an independent fundamental basis, right? So we're in the midst of that now. And what that means is at the moment, uh, that the market is not fully efficient. So there are lots of opportunities um, uh, for active investors to find good investments because in an inefficient market, you get a lot of mispricing. We expect defaults to continue to rise. And why is that? Not because Chinese companies are weaker or uh, you know, deserve to default more often. It's because default rates were very, very low. So if you look at uh, historical default rates prior to this, they were close to zero. Uh, whereas in, a, in any healthy, normal functioning market, you need defaults because defaults are the way that the market works. Good companies should be able to borrow at cheaper prices, but weak companies need to be from time to time punished, right? And they get punished by, by having market access withdrawn. Uh, they get punished because they default and they're not able to come to the market again. So defaults are necessary, um, necessary. and we expect uh, them to rise uh, as the market continues to mature. Um, but we, one should not be afraid of this, right? So, you know, uh, if the, the average default rate in the U.S. is, let's say, 3 to 4% over the cycle, China's around 2% now. So it can double before uh, it's even normal. Um, and we would expect that before this trend is over, and this will take multiple years, we could see default rates higher, maybe 5 or 6% for a brief period before settling down. So this means selection is very important. This means doing the fundamental work is very important. Um, and that's why we, we think it's so such an interesting period, because in this period, we think there will be lots of bargains to be had uh, because, you know, investors will, you know, uh, sell good things uh, at the same time as they sell bad things. Mistakes will be made um, and this will should provide for a very good environment for alpha. It's uh, very, very interesting. So uh, the COVID still remains as a risk. How do you factor it in into your portfolio? Uh, so COVID is is very uh, difficult, um, uh, mainly because you know it's not you know it's, it's heterogeneous, right? So in every market, it is a different thing. Um, uh, if we look at Asia, I think broadly speaking, Asia was first in and first out, uh, but the response and the approach to dealing with it has been very different. Uh, so I'm pr pr presently in Hong Kong, where cases never really got very high. Uh, but social distancing and restrictions have been at a very high level throughout. Um, and because they haven't been very many cases and many deaths, actually vaccination rates are very low. 
Uh, and that's because people feel like the risk is not very high versus the risk of actually taking the vaccine. Um, and so we could see that, uh, that Asia may not perform uh, quite the same as one would expect for uh, a region that has uh, you know, relatively low level of cases versus Europe, which is now, let's say, emerging uh, from um, uh, you know, the, the first round or you know, first or second or third wave of, uh, of the pandemic, but with vaccination rates that are much higher, which means that they might be able to uh, you know, return to full activity sooner. Um, so again, this is a case where uh, there's a lot of devil in the detail. Um, I think a lot of um, investors were looking at India saying that they had done such a great job because they never really had a very strong first or second wave only to see a very large and meaningful third wave uh, with, with devastating uh, consequences. Um, as investors, um, it's important to remember that, you know, we have to separate the tragedy and the human loss uh, that comes from, from a health crisis with the impact it's going to have on, on companies, because fundamentally we're invested in companies. Um, and also, because we're invested in the credit universe, not the equity universe, um, we don't really mind if our companies don't have a very strong uh, growth here, because as credit investors, growth really doesn't, uh, we don't really tend to need growth. Uh, what we want are strong, stable companies that are, you know, uh, doing the same thing uh, year after year, and that's good enough for us. Um, and also within the credit universe, we have uh, usually quite a large selection of, of uh, sectors that are more defensive. So think, you know, banks, think utilities, think um, uh, exporters uh, of raw materials, uh, think, uh, uh, infrastructure companies, um, and these are, are, are companies that don't tend to exist uh, in the equity indices, but exist in ours. And they have tended to uh, behave very well and perform very well through the pandemic, uh, you know, because, you know, we all still need electricity, we all still need gas, we all still need, um, you know, running water. Um, and, you know, we, we continue to have, uh, you know, to, to, to pay the bills. Uh, so um, as a result, I think, uh, again, this is something where we feel very excited because, being active investors, we're going to be able to choose, um, and the timing of that choice between countries and between sectors hopefully should should lead to good returns. Thank you, Alan. I think you've also explained a lot of uh, the underlying logic of the selection process. So um, let's move on to the question, like a more general question, growing inclusion into the major indices. Um, so this kind of process will push China's market further into the mainstream. And a lot of people are actually saying how um, China is becoming a new core, new asset class. What impact does it have? Well, the advantage, we know one of the advantages of uh, for Asia market is that it has a low correlation to the rest of the world. Will this advantage sustain in that case? Yes. So um, I think one of the key drivers of the interest, uh, in addition to the fact that you know, it, it offers an attractive yield at low correlation, at low uh, risk, so it's very advantage on a sharp basis. Um, another key driver has been the inclusion of China in key indices. So if two or three years ago, investors could say, look, you know, I, I hear you on the attractiveness of China, but it's not in my benchmark, and therefore, I'm not going to be hurt if I'm not invested. I don't have to take a view today. Even if uh, I, I believe you that you know, I could make uh, money for my end investors if I did this. Now, because it's in the index, it's, it's an active decision. So uh, for investors that are not engaging with China, not deciding whether or not this is a market that they want to be in, uh, they're going to have to reconcile that with their performance um, you know, because it's, it's now an active decision because it's a part of their, uh, part of their index. The second thing is, Given where geopolitics have, have, have turned, um, if we are returning to a world which is more bipolar or multipolar, um, and if, you know, let's say, uh, you know, the post-Trump uh, trade organization of the world is a much more nationalistic, uh, the other thing an investor has to do is, am I truly diversified if all I have um, is investments in Europe and uh, or in the West, right? Uh, if the world becomes let's say, more bipolar, right? Uh, should, do, should I not want investments um, in the half of the world that is growing faster uh, and that is likely to become a more important part of uh, global GDP and global savings? Um, so it's not, I think it's, it's no longer a decision that, that can be escaped. Now, uh, at the moment, the percentage of, of, um, of foreign investors in China is still very, very low. And it will take many, many years before it is at the level 
uh, that um, I think the low correlations will be unwound. So part of the reason for the low correlations is because um, many Western investors are not in China. So the way they behave um, has not in affected the prices at all. The second uh, is that you know China is one of the few large systems uh, that was previously closed and now is open. Um, and as a result, it is it is unique risk that doesn't yet exist elsewhere. So both of these features, the fact that it's a very large market and a lot of foreign investment will be needed before uh, foreign investors have a material uh, influence on the market. And the second, China's quite a unique uh, previously closed market that doesn't have many characteristics that are common to other markets um, mean that I expect the low correlation to be there for some time to, you know, uh, I would say at least five to 10 years, um, which is another reason why we think this is an interesting asset class, because this is not a decision for this week or next week. This is a decision for uh, the medium to long term. Manching, I think you're on mute. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. So um, my question will be, do you see more opportunities or risk when it comes to investment in small and mid cap companies within the Asia uh, capital market? You know, this is a, a, a specific area that is inherently under researched. Yeah, so uh, we benefit from the same sort of mid cap, small to mid cap universe that uh, uh, characteristics that our equity colleagues benefit from. So because Asia is very fast growing and because of the nature of the economy here, a lot of, in fact, it's very similar to Germany. Um, uh, and I would say the concept is is the Mittelstand, right? So not quite the same order of magnitude as Germany, but here you have a lot of small family businesses that do very specific things. Um, that because of their growth are now at the stage where they are considering, uh, you know, bond issuance for the first time. Um, so it's a very vibrant, very um, fast moving market. And what does that mean? That means, um, you know, if there are 641 issuers this year, uh, next year you could have 660, but maybe 200 of them would be brand new because companies come, companies go, there's mergers and acquisitions, there are companies that succeed, companies that fail, companies that grow much larger, uh, or companies that exit the market altogether. Um, and that's why you know, it, it's a very granular um, and very uh, deep and liquid market. And, for, for, and that's why as fundamental investors, we're so excited because um, you know, when you have that many things to choose from, uh, you know, chances are you'll find some good investments that will be able to generate alpha, right? It's much easier to do that when you have a, a big menu to choose from than uh, when you have to choose from a smaller uh, group. So uh, within Asia, we think that this is an important um, uh, segment, um, you know, bearing in mind that, that to be able to issue bonds in dollars, one has to be a certain size. So these are not, you know, uh, you know very, very small companies. These, these are companies with, with uh, EBITDAs of, at least uh, you know fifty million dollars or more. Uh, so you know all reasonably sized uh, businesses, um, but we think that the the prospects are very good. Very good. So um, there's another question regarding the sectors. Also, uh, one question from the audience: Where do you see value across sectors at the moment? Would you highlight some investment themes? Could you give us some examples um, of the premiumization trend outside of China, for example, in India and Southeast Asia? Right. OK. So in terms of sectors um, and here again, you know, the the the, uh, the difference between credit and equity, uh, you know, is, is an important one to make. So as a credit investor, um, I'm not looking for growth um, uh, because, you know, growth could mean risk. Right. Because if a company is investing uh, very much for growth, that increases the chance it makes a mistake and as a result cannot pay its debt. Uh, so we, we like growth, but we like growth when it is. Uh, sensible and reasonable. So the sectors that we like at the moment um, have a, a lot of sort of advantages, uh, you know, we, we feel uh, if given the stage of the economy. So um, we have been uh, very supportive of the metals and mining sector in the region. Um, and that is because um, in the recovery, in the post-COVID recovery, uh, you know, raw materials and raw commodities have uh, benefited uh, in terms of strong price increases. Um, as the region tilts towards sustainability, um, a lot more uh, investment is being made into renewables um, as well. So renewables, both in terms of things like electric vehicle manufacturing, 
uh, through, you know, and, and the, the entire value chain, so batteries, uh, transmissions, uh, so on and so forth, uh, but also things like uh, renewable generation, all of which have a very strong, uh, you know, specific demand on the commodity side. So we have been invested in, in, in this area because we think it's strategically advantaged. So, you know, companies that operate uh, that you know either build uh, or or operate um, renewable en uh, energy sources, uh, companies that supply key raw materials and key components for this, um, uh, have been a, a key source of um, uh, investments for us. Um, we also like utilities. We also like financials uh, because both of these have been extremely defensive uh, through the cycle. And remembering that this is a debt investment, not an equity investment. Uh, you know, these are uh, companies that tend to be very expensive on the equity side with not a lot of growth. For us, you know, they provide a very nice yield and something that we sleep very well at night. Um, and you can't really talk about Asia credit without talking about real estate. It's a very large sector, particularly in China. Um, and this is a sector that still um, we feel has very solid fundamental uh, backing. Uh, it's one of the few sectors globally that saw credit rating upgrades uh, during uh, the COVID year. Uh, because, you know, fundamentally, uh, you know, sales were still very strong um, and these companies were improving their credit metrics in the year. So this is another example of a sector that we that we like. Mm -hmm. So the last our last question would be as the market grow in maturity and we would be very interested to know what's your idea, what would be expected by investors in terms of liquidity, credit quality and policymakers? Yeah. So um, the, the market has matured very quickly. Um, it's one of the fastest regions, uh, fastest growing regions in EM. We expect this pace of growth to continue. Uh, this doesn't necessarily mean more bonds, but I think it does. It may mean better quality, better quality uh, of company. One of the key things that I have been very pleased to see. I mean, uh, so we didn't mention earlier, but because we're EM investors, ESG has been at the center of our process, right? Because the main reason that um, there is a premium for EM companies is because there, there are different uh, benchmarks in terms of ES and G in the EM versus uh, the developed world. Now that ESG has become central focus for everyone, not just in EM, uh, you know, we, we have uh, found that this is working to our strengths because this is something that we've been doing since inception. Um, and a lot of the companies that we've been investing in too have noticed, and they too are beginning to realize the value of, of having clearly articulated uh, positive goals uh, in this area uh, and we're engaging with these companies and hoping to to improve that going forward as well so this is in all areas so whether it's environmental in the way they, they interact socially but also uh, very importantly uh, on the governance side where we think that there's a, a, a big improvement to come so um, as the as the uh, asset class matures I think it's it's only going to increase in quality uh, and that's why you know fundamentally just to summarize again why we think this is you know uh, worthy of attention this is an investment grade, high quality uh, asset class that offers more yield than similarly rated asset classes without uh, having to take extra duration risk. Um, it's backed by you know, tremendous uh, sort of demographic advantages and, and growth that is quality in nature, uh, robust and resilient because it's building from a, from a lower base. And it is sort of many, many more people making smaller gains than it is one or two people making large gains. Um, and, and therefore, we think, um, you know, this is a story that will play out over the, the medium to long term. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the allocation can be made um, uh, not just for today, but for the years to come. Um, and so uh, that's why we think it's worthy of, of attention and interest. Mm -hmm. So a very big thank you to Alan being here today. I appreciate it very much. Um, hopefully you will leave better informed and potentially excited for the opportunity uh, in this asset class. We will be coming up with more featured segments in the next week, so stay tuned for our Asia Investment Special Series. I hope you all enjoy today's Portfolio Manager Conference. Have a wonderful day and see you next time. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.